Hello, I would just like to welcome everybody. My name is Nicole Jansizian. I'm the news editor of All Israel News and All Arab News. I would just like to say Shalom from Jerusalem and welcome everybody to this very exciting event. I mean, all of you are probably here because you know Joel Rosenberg, you know of Joel Rosenberg, you've read his books and um, Joel has been on a month long tour with his new book, Enemies and Allies. And um, this is going to be the first time, and I'm so grateful to Joel that he is giving us the scoop. This is gonna be the first time we're hosting where he's going to be answering readers' questions and not just the media's questions. So I think that this is very exciting. So um, I would like to welcome Joel Rosenberg, New York Times selling best, um, bestseller, New York Times bestselling author. And this is why I'm in print journalism and uh, the founder and editor in chief of all Israel news and all Arab news. So Joel, um, I would love to talk to you about your book, Enemies and Allies, how, you know, you're, where are you now and how's it going with your tour? Great to be with you, Nicole. I'm so glad we're doing this. And you're right. If, if we're going to do a, um, a, you know, a conversation, a webinar with 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 readers' questions, it ought to be with all Israel news and all Arab news, right? I mean, who else? Um, the tour has been going well, and um, uh, you know, I joke that I, 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 yes, I have a little bit of jet lag, but mostly it's life lag. It, like like it's you know, the life of a of a writer is such a um, schizophrenic life, in the sense that you know, mostly when you know, I was writing enemies and allies, it's total quiet. Uh, it's it's I'm in seclusion. Right. I, I, you know, it, for all the tragedy of COVID, all the lockdowns in Israel gave me a lot of time. And I was, you know, just asking the Lord, how can I use that wisely? And, and I ended up deciding to write this book. But that's a very quiet season of my life. Then comes the book tour and it's like being shot out of a cannon. And uh, so I've been in, you know, Dallas and uh, Albuquerque and Colorado Springs and Indianapolis and I'm in Washington, D.C. now, and there's a bunch of other cities I'm not mentioning. But, um, yeah, so I'm here for one day. One, uh, This is the last day in D.C. Uh, meetings, uh, interviews. Um, uh, met with a Jordanian ambassador this morning to present copies of this book to her and her team, but also to His Majesty King Abdullah, uh, the King of Jordan, and to, and to the guy that the advisor to the king who had first uh, introduced me uh, to the king. So I uh, dropped off those books, had a lovely uh, time of, of tea with her. And it's meetings all over. Uh, yesterday was with Vice President Pence um, uh, at his new home. Uh, he and his wife, Karen, have been longtime dear friends, and they've just bought a new home um, near Indianapolis. Uh, and uh, there's a picture of us. Yeah, we, it was lovely to be with them. And uh, about two and a half hours just talking uh, yes, about this book, because he endorsed it. He's a big part of this book because he was a big part of the Abraham Accords and so forth and all the Trump team's uh, successes and challenges. But also uh, he's working on a book and Israel and the Middle East will be a, a key part of his book. So we spent a lot of time talking. So I'm a little tired, but but Lord willing, I got, I got Nashville um, this weekend and then next Tuesday, Lord willing, I head back home to Israel. Well, welcome back uh, when, you, when you come. Um, I, you know, I know that um, there's the expression that life imitates art and, um, and art imitates life. And in this case, it uh, looks like in, in, in this book, life is imitating life. You, usually you write um, fiction and then people see it, you know, uh, life eventually imitates your books. But um, in this case, um, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated at how everything we're seeing in the headlines today, um, we can see the, the seeds of it in, in your book, at which, was, uh, which you began um, how many years ago? Well, the process of doing all these trips to sit down with all these Middle Eastern leaders and so forth, uh, that really began with meeting King Abdullah five years ago. I didn't think I was going to write a book on any of this at the time because who knew it was going to even happen and uh, but um but it's been about a year and a half to two years that i was working on the book you know once i knew i was going to do it and uh and and 
enemies and allies just came out on September 7th. So we're really in the early stages of beginning to get this word out. And I will say, Nicole, one of the things that's interesting about this season is one of the things I'm noticing as I travel all across the United States and do all this media is for the last 18 months or so, Americans have not been focused on Israel and the Middle East. Obviously, our readers at All Israel News and All Arab News are very interested. And that's why they've, you know, that's why they follow what we're writing and, and analyzing. That's why they've signed up for these emails, uh, because they're, you know, worried about what's going on in the region. They're also excited about some of the positive things that are going on in the region. But it's hard to find any coverage in the United States, any credible coverage, any consistent coverage. It's like the media doesn't care because there's, and, and admittedly, there's been some big issues going on here in the United States, COVID and race riots and critical race theory and the divisive political campaign and a, a very messy inaugural season and, you know, a lot of issues. So I think that people, even people who care about Israel and the region have been distracted and haven't been focused as much as they may, might normally be. And so I think this book, because it's the first, it's the only book that takes you inside the Iran threat, that takes you inside the, the question of 20 years after 9-11, where are we with the threat of radical Islamism? But also the first and only book that tells the inside story of the Abraham Accords. What, what are these? What do they mean? Are they legit? Are they, are they uh, should we be happy about that? Or is this some sort of ruse or, or pretext to you know, endanger Israel? Um, this book deals with that, and it's the only one that does. And uh, so I've been finding a lot of interest uh, because people, because what's happened in Afghanistan has sort of forced the issue back to the front burner. Oh my gosh, I thought we were done with the Middle East. I thought we were done with radical Islamism. And now, how in the world did we just surrender a country that we'd already won? And um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of. Uh, curiosity, but also um, bewilderment, what in the world is going on over in the Middle East? Right, right. And something, I mean, I am amazed, um, you know, like chapter 25 in particular, I feel like I'm reading um, today's news in a way, um, you know, in, in Enemies and Allies, uh, where, you know, you just write about America's retreat from the Middle East and how it's concerning um, a lot of uh, Arab states and Israel. And um, you know, and I just find that we're seeing it play over and over again in all of the um, in the in the news from Afghanistan to Iraq and um, you know so very so it's very interesting. But I also I mean I do want to ask a lot of questions of, of you, but this is for the readers, so I'll let. <laughs> so I think we should go to the uh, readers' questions and um, um, I'll I'll cede the floor. But I have. Um, all right, so our first question um, is um, the peace accords with Israel, Abraham Accords, are very important in this world. Joel, as an evangelical, how do you see these advancing the gospel of salvation through Jesus alone to both the Jews and the Muslims? And how do you balance the two different goals? And that's from Tom from uh, Calvary Mission Outreach. Okay, wow. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, obviously, uh, the, the peace and normalization agreements uh, between Israel and these countries um, are not intended in any way on the Jewish side in Israel or the Muslim side uh, in the Arab world intended to, to help advance the gospel. So let's just, po you know, let, let's just posit that, um, stipulate that. Um, one of the things that's interesting, though, and you'll see it as you read enemies and allies is there's a there's a tectonic shift going on in Muslim attitudes towards Jews and towards Christians, meaning Muslims and Jews, you know, by and large, overwhelmingly still, you know, want to hold their own religious and political views. But where historically Muslims have seen Christians and Jews as at least an adversary and often as an enemy, um, that is changing, okay? And it used to be that if you were a Muslim in the Middle East, 
you really didn't want to have any contact with Jews or Christians because that was somehow seen as a betrayal of your own tribe, as your of your own faith. We can't countenance, um, you know, interfaith dialogue or any type of kindness towards because Jews and Christians are the enemy. That's the way the Muslim world saw it. And this is a, I, like, again, I can't use superlatives that are dramatic enough, tectonic, seismic, historic, game-changing. That, and pick those four and as many others as you want. Attitudes towards Jews and Christians are changing deeply. It's sweeping changes. So that these Arab Muslim leaders who've invited me, of all people, to come and bring the first ever delegations of evangelical Christians to their countries, and then decided, they decided to publicize these and put it on the front page of every newspaper and on television. This was, this was because they're trying to send a message. We as Muslims ought to have warmer, positive relations with Jews and Christians, even if we disagree with them theologically, which they do, and we do, and even if they disagree with us politically, which in many ways they do. So that's, a, that's an important element. The other element is there is a religious freedom movement that is really expanding in the Middle East. And I would just say Jewish people generally still don't want to hear Christians to share the gospel with them, and Muslims don't really want that either generally. And yet, there is a curiosity about what followers of Jesus think and believe. And I mean, think of me, Nicole. I'm a Jew who is a follower of Jesus. I'm an American, but I'm also an Israeli citizen. I have four sons, two of which have served in the Israeli army. Why would the Saudi, the head of the Saudi royal family, at least the number two of the crown prince, but the de facto leader, why in the world would he invite me of all people to come and sit with him? And while he did, I said, you know, your Royal Highness, um, I'm guessing the term evangelical Christian is not one, it's not a term used much here in the kingdom. Is that fair? And he said, yeah, that's pretty laughed. He said, that's probably true. I said, well, we have a, an ordained pastor on our delegation could he just take a moment and, and sort of define some terms? What is an evangelical and what do we believe? And he said, absolutely. So that was really interesting. We're, so I mean, it's a hard thing to answer that specific question. I would say that missions work, the, what's really specifically missions work, that is still a very under the radar, very sensitive issue in, in the epicenter, in the Middle East. But Jews and Christians, particularly followers of Jesus, interacting with Arabs, with Muslims, with others at, 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 on the street or at the highest levels of government, there's an openness now saying, well, what is it that you guys believe? Why are you for peace? What, how does your faith in Jesus motivate you? That is, a, that is an open question now, and I think that's positive. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, since this is not a focus on exactly on missions, then, then that's, the, I think, the best I can do at the moment. But I think the reader, will, uh, Tom, I think you said, will find this book interesting um, because of that question. Well, I have um, on the subject of Saudi Arabia, we have a question about um, evangelical Christians uh, from Kimbria. And she says, it's wonderful that you and other evangelicals were, were able to meet with these leaders. Did you discuss the freedom or lack of freedom for Christians of Christians to worship in their countries, especially in Saudi Arabia? We absolutely did. And in fact, that was our main uh, motive for accepting the invitation of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and in really all of the delegations, the six delegations that I led to these various Arab countries, rel advancing religious freedom has been our, our main motivation. Now, there are others. We certainly want to discuss and encourage Arab-Israeli peacemaking, which let's make a note that the, Arab, the Abraham Accords, which I'm sure we'll get to later in other questions, I'm guessing, those were that, that had not happened yet when we were traveling. But we, I'll, I'll tell you some interesting stories about how we got a sneak preview that the, these deals were coming, these peace and normalization deals. But in terms of religious freedom, that was our central issue. Yes, we wanted to learn about their views of Iran and radical Islamism, the Muslim Brotherhood, Al Qaeda. Yeah, there was a lot of things we wanted to talk about, but religious freedom was the most important. 
And we, we brought up directly with the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, look, you don't have a single church on Saudi soil. The United Arab Emirates, they have more than 700 freely operating churches. We were just there, Your Royal Highness. In Egypt, uh, President El Sisi is rebuilding at government expense all the churches that were burned down, damaged, destroyed during the the Arab Spring and the Muslim Brotherhood reign of terror. Uh, President El Sisi has built the largest church in the history of the Middle East and invited me to bring a second delegation to be there when he gifted it to the Christians of Egypt on Christmas Eve. Like that's never happened in human history. That was amazing. And I tell those stories in the book. Um, and there are other examples. In Jordan, there are you know, many churches, but Saudi Arabia has 1.4 million 1.4 million professed Christians and their families. They're all foreign workers, admittedly, but they live and work in Saudi Arabia and there's not a single church for them. And we pressed on both of our visits with, with MBS, this needs to change. Uh, will you change it? And so, and those conversations are on the record and people will, you know, you can, you can read that conversation in, in detail um, in Enemies and Allies. Okay, um, we have another um, Saudi Arabia related question. So I think this is a, a good segue um, because it, it concerns the death of Jamal Khashoggi. Mm -hmm. um, um, and um, it's a, the, the, the question is from Pastor Dick from Wisconsin. Um, he says there was considerable, considerable confusion as to what actually happened at the time. You summarize much of that in your book, and the Saudi prince explained that his country's involve, involvement as he understood it at the time. Um, was there any was any additional clarification revealed as time went by as to what actually happened? Did the time uh, that has since elapsed following your trip uh, to Saudi Arabia, in which you described the prince's vision for the year 2030, change your understanding of his position? on the world stage mm. and is this uh is the vision for his reforms on schedule so i think it's yeah, like that's a, a lot of, that's a lot yeah, let's a break lot it out yes, yes. So we'll break it out in pieces and we'll start with jamal khashoggi because yeah. october 2nd just a few days from now is the third anniversary of that horrific murder and um so there's a couple of things first of all you have to know that at that time, before I'd met MBS, uh, in real time, I was writing about that. First of all, we thought it was a disappearance of Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi dissident, the Washington Post columnist. Um, we, you know, he was missing, and we all were. I, I was asking Christians all over the world to pray for him and for his family and for him to be safely found. And then we discovered, you know, it was revealed that he was brutally murdered. Uh, in an act of, that I said at the time, I say in the book, I said to MBS directly, was cruel and, and un, you know, unconscionable. Um, and this really framed, that murder framed our first visit because, of course, it's important for people to know we were invited by the crown prince to come to Saudi Arabia in the summer of 2018. No, long before any of this happened. So we'd been invited and we said yes. Well, then, and, and we were supposed to be arriving in Saudi Arabia, I believe on either the 30th or 31st of October, okay? So we're talking about less than a month, just a few weeks after Khashoggi's disappearance. And then we learned that he'd actually been murdered and butchered for crying out loud. Just a, a sickening crime. There's no other way to put it. Um, we had to make a decision. Are we still going? And not a lot of people knew that we were going, but we had an inner circle of, of people praying for us and, and um, sort of advising us, people I'd reached, reached out to. And a number of close friends told me, you should not go to Saudi Arabia. This is, if you go, when, when business leaders and senators and others are, are bailing, I mean, they're canceling trips because why would, why would you go meet the guy who might have ordered this murder, this sickening, horrific, unconscionable murder? And this was a, this was a struggle. And I, and I write about exactly what happened in the book. And I describe this, this struggle because, yeah, why, why would you go? Now, there was a couple of reasons we did go. 
and I and again I'll say it in the book, but I'll say it here. First of all, I had met with the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, Adel Al Jubair, at the United Nations in mid September, I think it was um, early September. It was around now, actually, um, of, of of eighteen. In order to first, it's the first time I met him, and just to talk about some of the preparations for our trip. And one of the things that uh, the foreign minister told me was, Joel, do you realize that you're the first group of Christian leaders that have ever been invited to the palace in Riyadh in the 300 years that the Saud family has controlled, you know, so much of the Arabian Peninsula? No, I, I did not know that. And at the time, this was pre knowing anything about the, you know, the Khashoggi murder, it hadn't happened yet. I thought, wow, that's amazing that, that, that the Saudi government would invite a Jewish evangelical Israeli American, like what, or invite anybody. Once we understood that this murder, you know, this thing had unfolded and it was a, it was a global firestorm in the media and rightly so, then we thought, you know, well, do you go or not go? Now, one of the reasons we decided to go was because we were the first group of Christian leaders in history to be welcomed, invited to come and sit and talk to the top leader of Saudi Arabia about the issues that we wanted to discuss, like why are there no churches and what are you doing about extremism in the mosques and what are you doing about, you know, the threat from Iran and are you interested in peace with Israel and all those things that we wanted to discuss. And um, we thought if we don't go, then we may be one acting as judge and jury because it was, you know, it was very early on in what was going on. And, and we're sort of, we're sort of assuming that he's guilty in ordering that murder, even though that was not um, known, it was just a discussion. But the, but the, the other thing was, how are we going to have this conversation? We may be shutting the door for future generations of Christians since it's never happened. And third, the Apostle Paul wanted to and went forward in meeting with Nero, the Caesar in Rome. Now, I'm not equating MBS to Nero, but some might. I don't. But what I'm saying is the Apostle Paul said, I believe God wants me to be a witness to the top leadership of this country. And of course, he went and changed and we didn't. But anyway, for all those reasons, and I just get into more detail in the book, we decided to go. And I'll, I'll just summarize that to say, we had to, therefore, bring up these questions about, you know, did you order the murder of Jamal Khashoggi? How did this happen? What are you going to do about it? How are you going to make it right? How, how can you have a Vision 2030 plan? Where does that go if everybody thinks that you're a murderer? I mean, can you imagine having that conversation with the person accused? And, and um, it was very difficult to think of yourself as going in. I'm not a foreign minister. I'm not the secretary of state. I'm not a prime minister or a president, right? So it was, uh, it was one of the most, I mean, it was the most high stakes meeting I've ever been in my entire life. And I, I think I did my best to capture how difficult that conversation was in the book. Um, let me stop there for a moment, and I know you there were other parts to that question, but I, but I will say also this. To this date, it's important, and I do say this, to this date, there is no evidence. There's no solid, smoking gun, clear, unequivocal evidence that MBS ordered that murder. Now, people assume it. They say, how? It, there's no way in the Saudi system it could have happened unless he ordered it. That may be, okay? I, I say in the book, it's possible, right? But I also say we have to be careful when we say it's so obvious, be, it's just uh, like, um, we, you know, it's, it's, it's a certainty because it, there's no other way it could have happened. And I would just give two examples and I give them in the book, but, but for this, because it's so important, there were many people, many Americans who said, you know, Donald Trump absolutely colluded with the Russians to win the 2016 presidential campaign because there's no way he could have won unless he had, right? 
That was the allegation. And to many Americans, there was like, duh, like it's just obvious. That's it. Abs- there's no way he could have won. So, of course, he did it. But a 35 or $40 million investigation by Robert Mueller found out actually he didn't do it. There's literally no evidence that he did it, even though to many, it was it was certain. Like there wasn't even a question. It was just a matter of finalizing the evidence and you know proving it. So that's an important. But the other one that so that would, you know, if but if you're a Republican, you say, see, now if you're a Democrat, you say, well, what about all the people that thought, as President George W. Bush thought, that there were chemical weapons in Iraq in large and dangerous amounts necessitating the United States going into war in Iraq to remove Saddam Hussein in 2003. Like that, that was just a sacrosanct, of course he has them, right? All the circumstantial evidence, of course he has them. He had them before, he used them, he he won't let them inspectors in, et cetera, et cetera. We got there, what seemed certain, and not just to Bush and his team, but to the French and the British and the Israelis, and it wasn't true. So we have to be careful, really careful, when we accuse someone of murder, and we say, well, it, it has to have been. But there's, I, I'm telling you, I've looked very carefully. There's literally no evidence to prove it. And so we just have to be careful with an ally to accuse someone of cold-blooded murder when you can't prove it is dangerous, um, especially when President Biden, who, who, who effectively clearly believes and has said it, he believes MBS is mur- guilty of murder, and yet President Biden is fully willing to inter, uh, to negotiate with the new president of Iran, Ibrahim Raisi, who is currently under U.S. economic sanctions for murdering 30,000 of his own people in Iran. So the Biden administration is struggling because they say, oh, we're not going to deal with MBS because he might have killed one person. And I'm not saying it's right. I think it's horrible. But we can't prove it. But it's there's no question that Ibrahim Raisi killed 30,000. So why? what's the principle by which we're negotiating with Iran and treating Saudi Arabia as a pariah state? So that's a long answer, uh, longer than I intended, but it, it's because this issue is so important. And I think I spend more time on Saudi Arabia in this book than any other country. Well, with, I mean, with good reason. I mean, it looks like Saudi Arabia, I think you've re- re- referred to before as the big kahuna. Like if this, if Saudi Arabia comes in to the peace accords with Israel, right. then you've got a geographic, um, you know, block of, uh, uh-huh. of nations um, that go, you know, almost from coast to coast uh, here um, that will be um, an alliance against uh, uh, Iran and, you know, um, just a yeah. really good economic development as well. So, I mean, it makes sense right. to focus on right now. The, it seems the focus is on Saudi Arabia. But are you able, can you briefly just um, answer that, um, you know, what you think of the, the, um, the Prince's 2030 uh, vision? Um, uh, and yes. also, I think it's uh, fantastic. I think it's fantastic. I think it's, look, MBS is engaged in the most important, most significant, most sweeping, and most positive reforms in the history of Saudi Arabia. That doesn't absolve him if he murdered somebody. But if we, but if he didn't murder for, if he said, for example, to his team, hey, take care of this, this is a mess, go, go take care of Jamal Khashoggi, and he meant go arrest him or go bring him back for a questioning or whatever, but his team thought he was playing by the old Saudi rules, the old Middle Eastern rules, and they killed him. Well, that's bad. But if he, if he didn't, if he was like, Oh no, that's not what I meant. What are you, what are you, what are you guys doing? And he put these people in prison. He put them on, well, I put them on trial and put them in prison. And um, so, um, but the vision 20 thing, 30 thing is super important. And I've been telling United States senators and congressmen go talk to MBS directly. Only two United States senators in the last several years have gone and met with MBS since the Khashoggi murder. I've met with him twice and spent more than four hours with him, and 98 U.S. senators have spent have spent no time with him. What's wrong with that picture, right? Now you might say, "Well, I don't want to deal with him." Why not? He's a he's an American ally, and there are big problems we have with Saudi Arabia that need to get fixed, and he needs to be pressed. Yes, he's making good reforms, but there's a whole lot more. That has to be done, 
But the way to engage MBS, I say in the book, is not by railing at him from a TV studio in Washington or on the floor of the United States Senate. Go and talk to him, meet with him, press him, you know, uh, 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 affirm the decisions that he's making that are good, but press him on the stuff that he's not doing right or not doing well enough. Or So that's my view is that it's a huge mistake to just, you know, put him in the doghouse and say, I'm not dealing with him. That's that usually doesn't, you know, if you were in marriage counseling, you'd be like, that's not saying I'm never going to talk to my spouse who I have disagreements with or my son or my daughter whom I'm estranged from. That's not going to help. Mm-hmm. You need to engage. And that's the only way to uh, to work together. And if you're engaging with Iranian leadership, why aren't you, which was a, an enemy, our worst enemy, one of our worst enemies. Why wouldn't you engage with uh, Saudi Arabia and the vision 2030 is the way to engage with them. This this economic and social reform plan has a clock that's ticking and it's the standard by which MBS has set for himself to the entire planet. So go and hold him to say, listen, vision 2030 will never work if you can't persuade people to come and do business, come and do tourism, come and do technology deals. If it, Yeah, a CEO can come in and sign a billion dollar deal with Saudi Arabia, but when he gets home and his spouse or his board or her spouse or her board says, what are you insane? What are you making a deal with MBS for? No, we won't. You're not going to be able to bring in that foreign direct, direct investment and all that tourism and all that technology if you're seen as a horrific, barbaric country. So that's built into MBS's own strategy is the way to help him make the reforms he has to make to make his country normal and good and friendly and to be perceived as normal, good and friendly. Okay. All right. And now we're about halfway through. um, We're going to try to keep this to an hour. So I just wanted to uh, mention, because a lot of people are asking, uh, where can we buy the book? And where are you going to be in Nashville? And um, uh, and also, can you buy the book in Israel? And um, so um, just to let everybody know who's listening, we're going to put the answers. Uh, we're going to get the answers to you um, in the chat. And uh, we'll let you know, you know, all the details where you can buy the book. We'll send a link to where you can buy the book. We'll, um, and there's um, also a link to uh, Joel's book tour. So hopefully it gives you the details about uh, Nashville and wherever else, if you're if you're close by. I just want to say also, uh, we have people here from Kenya, uh, Marhaba from Turkey uh, as well, um, uh, Oklahoma, Lynchburg, Virginia, um, Puerto Rico. Um, I mean, this is great. So anyway, we're really happy to have you all here. Um, um, and I'm gonna go back to the questions. I have a, a question uh, from John from Nevada. Uh, who asked, have you interacted uh, with the with Arabs or Islamists about um, the biblical uh, prophecies, end time prophecies? That's an interesting question. Yes, I have. Um, those interactions are usually not on the record <laughs> because it's almost like a Nicodemus meeting with Jesus. Not that I'm Jesus and not that they're Nicodemus. Don't get the analogy wrong, but that's a, that's a very sensitive question. But I uh, a, a very senior advisor to the Iraqi prime minister uh, was in Washington a number of years ago, and he wanted to meet with me for, uh, to talk about several things, but then he kind of got eventually to what he really wanted to talk about, and he asked me, "Where is what, what happens to Iraq in Bible prophecy? I, I was kind of blown away because I, at that point, I'd never been asked that question by an Arab, by a Muslim uh, so that was a very interesting conversation with President El Sisi. The one area that I, I am on the record with is in our meeting. We, I, I've had five different interactions with him, but the first one, well, not the second one, the one that we were actually in the palace in in Cairo, actually in Heliopolis. Uh, one of the pastors in our delegation, the last thing we brought up was Isaiah 19. And what is the future of Egypt according to Bible prophecy, both the really dark 
bad things that are going to happen in, in Egypt in the eschatological future and the good things, the blessings of God that are coming. But it was very interesting to see this pastor just kind of walk the president of Egypt through Isaiah 19 in the palace I mean, El Sisi, to his credit, he knows the story of Jesus and his mother and father coming to visit, uh, you know, for several years uh, in the Bible. And he knows the story of Moses and Joshua living there in the nation of Israel and all these different stories. So many, actually, uh, prophets um, in the Bible spent time in Egypt, Jeremiah and, and many others. Uh, but he, he, I, I, he didn't strike me as being familiar with Isaiah 19. That was fascinating. To say it, to share it, and share it respectfully, mm -hmm. and um, that was uh, yeah. So I've had these conversations all over the region. Sometimes I can write about them. Uh, most often I cannot, but it's interesting. And I will say this: uh, I do write a chapter in Enemies and Allies about what do evangelical Christians believe according to the Bible about the future of the Middle East. Because here I am writing geopolitically, economically, socially, what, where is this region going? What does Netanyahu think? What does, you know, MBS think? What does LCC think? What does King Abdullah think about the future of their country and region? And I thought, well, let's, you know, what, what does the Bible say? What do Christians believe? Uh, not every Christian agrees with this, this uh, interpretation of these prophecies, but I give sort of a thumbnail sketch of several of the key prophecies. And, um, as I've been dropping off these books and meeting with uh, Arab ambassadors to, so that they can put these in diplomatic pouches to go back to their leaders and so forth. Um, I know they're going to read this book and, um, and they're going to get a sense of what our, you know, what our, what, what our scriptures say and, uh, and what does that mean? And um, so, yeah, um, I love those conversations. Uh, often I have to be very discreet about them. Yeah, no, that's uh, totally understood. But speaking of Egypt, uh, James from Texas wants to know regarding um, uh, President El Sisi um, and the other Egyptian leaders who you met. Um, in your opinion, would they see much variance between Al Qaeda, Boko Haram, Daesh, Hamas, Hezbollah, ISIS, Muslim Brotherhood, and Salafis? beliefs, practices, and goals. Uh, what about the leaders you met in Jordan and Saudi Arabia? So I guess well, how all of yeah. the, uh, the- Well, the I think uh, James from Texas is gonna find this book interesting because um, Sisi was the longest conversation. We almost went three hours with him in that in that meeting in the palace. And then and then a number of other meetings that you'll, you'll read about as well. But, but he was pretty expansive about his view of what radical Islamism is, and he lumps all those organizations together, the Sunni organizations in the same basic grouping, which is, yeah, they have different flavors. They're, you know, it's all Baskin Robbins, 57 different flavors of ice cream, but it's all cold and, you know, sugary. Like, in other words, it's all based on in this concept of radical Islamism. If you summarize it very simply is, do you believe as a Muslim, that it's it's okay that and even that you should use violence to achieve political and religious objectives. The vast majority of Muslims don't think that. And I've studied just hundreds of polls from dozens of countries over two decades. And the vast majority of Muslims don't think that. But a radical Islamist says, yes, I do believe you can and should use violence to achieve your objectives. And and Al Sisi is is uh, has, has he's clear-minded about this. He's a Muslim, but he's against Boko Haram and ISIS and Al-Qaeda and of course the Muslim Brotherhood and so forth because he sees them as so dangerous. He, yes, there are different nuances of that among them, but it's but they're not they're not important nuances in the sense of you either believe that you can you can and should use violence or you don't. And so he believes it's his mission in life not only to fight those types of terrorists and secure Egypt from this revolutionary, you know, bloody, horrible, chaotic season that they went through, but also to fight ideologically and theologically. El Sisi, and I, I say this in the book, gave one of the most important speeches of any Arab leader I, I can even, that, that, that's ever happened, that I can even write about. When he went to the, the, the Harvard of Islam, Al-Azhar 
University in Cairo. And he told the, the Muslim clerics and scholars, you need to reform this, this religion because if you make the world keep thinking that Islam is violent and bloodthirsty, you're all gonna be fit, you're all gonna face the judgment of God on judgment day. Basically told them they're gonna go to hell if they don't clean up their ways. That's that was a stunning speech. And uh and I write about that in the book. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is why you you, you got to get the book. It's like an encyclopedia. And um, also... No, it's not an encyclopedia. It, it is first person. It, yes, there's a okay. lot of history. And I know what you mean by that. There's a lot what, of what, really good information. Yeah. Well, what makes this interesting is that it, it's, it reads as a narrative because I'm basically yeah. taking you into the room with yeah. me. You know, that's one of the reasons that Americans don't want to, or people all over the world, don't they like I know I need to know about the Middle East, but I don't have I, I it's so boring. I know it's important, but I can't. But this is a very interesting personal story where you get to come with me and uh, and, right. and hear these leaders, whether you agree with them or not, love them or hate them. You're going to hear what these leaders think in their own words. And so I think that is the distinctive about this book. Right. That's true. And uh, I wasn't judging the writing. I was like, the no, no, writing it's, was like, it's, one of your, it's like one of your novels. I mean, it, it reads. You're you know, interested in this yeah. stuff, Nicole. If somebody yeah. hears encyclopedia, they're like, oh. You're my right. God. You're right. You're right. Sorry. I, I, no. <laughs> no, it's OK. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the information. Um, we have a few questions about um, whether the Palestinians will honor a treaty and um, specifically um, what role the West Bank uh, and Gaza um, Palestinians will play in a future relationship between Israel and the other um, Middle Eastern countries? And that question is from George. It's also part of a question from uh, somebody else from Nitsa, I think. Uh, thank you guys. I'm like all over. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I deal with the, the, the Palestinian question um, uh, towards the end of the book because I think the Palestinian people are among the, the saddest and loneliest and um, most forgotten and, and in many ways um, despised people in the world. Um, their brand, unfortunately, as a people, comes from the terrorists, Yasser Arafat and other uh, terrorist actions, hijacking planes, blowing things up, of course, attacking Israeli school buses and cafes, killing children. So that is sort of imprinted on people's uh, minds and hearts that Palestinians is, a, is a, in, in for, for many, not all, of course, a, a very negative brand. I think that in many ways, the Palestinian people are, are sheep without a shepherd. And I am critical, of course, of Hamas, who I, you know, who controls Gaza. I mean, remember, Israel left Gaza completely withdrew all its soldiers, all its settlers, all its you know, involvement and investment in, Ga in the Gaza Strip in 2005, okay, that's been 16 years without any Israelis on the ground in Gaza. Gaza's on the Mediterranean coast. It has trillions of cubic feet of natural gas right off their borders, uh, right off their coast, uh, tremendously industrious and smart and, and uh, people. Why is it not a paradise? It could be, but it, the problem is that the people of, the Palestinian people of Gaza, are being held high, hostage, not by Israel, we're not there, but by Hamas, which keeps using Gaza as a base camp to attack Israel and thus invites retaliation. Then in the West Bank, of course, we, you know, you, I think, just wrote the story for us, um, or one of the staff did, 80% uh, of Palestinians in the West Bank think that Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, he just needs to step down. He's corrupt. He's out of touch. He's, you know, he's blocking progress, leave, step down. So th that's 80% of the country. And, and of course, Abbas was just going to have elections a few months ago, and then he canceled those elections. So the Palestinian people are stuck. Okay. It's not that I would agree with every position a Palestinian has, but I do care for them as people because I'm a human being and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And as an Israeli, I'm commanded to love my neighbor. That's in the Old Testament. And Jesus, of course, commands me to love my neighbor. Well, some people say, well, the Palestinians aren't neighbors, they're enemies. Okay. Well, Jesus commands us to love our enemies. Oh, come on, Joel. That covers every possible person. Exactly. So I don't have to agree with somebody entirely on their 
politics or their faith or whatever, but I am commanded to love them. How can, how can we as Christians love the Palestinian people when they're so badly treated by their own leadership? Uh, I don't have a clear pathway of exactly how this is supposed to work geopolitically, but I, I see Arab leaders express tremendous frustration to me on the record and off. They say, we are trying to help the Palestinian people uh, negotiate. We're trying to help, you know, the United Arab Emirates recently sent several plane loads for, worth of COVID supplies and vaccines and masks and all the Palestinian leadership rejected it. Why? because the UAE had normalized relations with Israel. And you just see the frustration among Arab leaders saying, we are trying to help the Palestinian people. They won't let us. Now, I don't think that's the people. I think that's the leadership, but it, it breaks my heart. And we need to, I'm, look, I'm an Israeli who loves Palestinians. Uh, and I, I don't mind saying that. Um, how to love my na Palestinian neighbors all the time, I'm not always sure, but um, I'm trying. My family is trying. And, and we certainly want to strengthen our Christian brothers and sisters who are Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, we don't have to agree with them on every point of politics or eschatology, but we can love and honor them and strengthen them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, we've got about, let's say like 15 minutes left and we have a okay. million questions left. So, um, okay. I'm I'll try to do a lightning I round. Yeah. These are good I, big questions. I mean, they're, no, they're they're huge. Um, so I am going to combine um, topics um, because there's a lot of questions about similar topics. And, um, you know, of course, we just had the one year anniversary of the Abraham Accords. And so people are asking about like the trend lines and maybe, you know, if, if any insight as to who would be next or if the Biden administration is going to continue um, the Abraham Accords. Okay, well, several things I would say. Uh, interesting, um, we just covered on our site all Arab news, right? Um, that 300 prominent Iraqi academics and government officials and, and uh, clerics and others called for at a conference in Kurdistan, in, in Northern Iraq, in the city of Erbil, a city I've been to four times over the years, they called for normalization between Iraq and Israel. Now, unfortunately, the follow-up story that you guys had to write was, and now the Iraqi government is calling for the arrest of all those people. Yes, um, actually, some reneged on what they, um, uh, they already reneged and they, they yeah. revoked what they said. So, so this is a very, it shows how this is not easy. And the critics who said, oh, you know, the Trump administration and trying to, you know, four Arab-Israeli normalization agreements, ah, that was so easy. Anyone could have done it. First of all, nobody had for a quarter of a century, so I think that's a big deal. Personally, I think that United Arab Emirates Crown Prince and Netanyahu and the Bahraini King and 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 President Trump, they all deserve uh, Nobel Peace Prizes because they did something that's not easy. And what's going on in Iraq right now that shows there's people who want to do this, but it is not easy. And it's easy to it, what is easy is to intimidate people who want peace into into backing off. So. I think, uh, I, I don't expect peace between Iraq and Israel anytime soon, but there are other countries to, to watch for. I think, of course, as we mentioned before, Saudi Arabia would be the mother of all peace deals. And I think they are actively weighing, is it in their national interest to make peace with Israel? I think they'll do it somewhat differently if they do it than the Abraham Accords per se. They may technically join it, but I think they may carve out their own version of the deal. I'm encouraging them to do it. We'll see. Let's keep praying uh, as those of us who are Christians. Um, you know, Oman is a country uh, that, that you know, invited Netanyahu to come and visit several years ago. Um, there are other countries, um, um, but I think we, we also need to see the, the countries that have made these decisions this needs to be solidified. The relationship's deepened. I'm glad to see uh, Israeli Foreign Minister Yair Lapid in Bahrain today, the first ever senior official in, uh, from Israel. Uh, there you go. Uh, we're, we're covering it. Uh, uh, that's what we do here at All Israel News and All Arab News, covering what's breaking right now. And I think Lapid, I know he's laying the groundwork for Prime Minister B uh, Bennett's uh, upcoming visits, uh, which will be the first historic, amazing uh, visits both to uh, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, and eventually 
to Morocco. I'm, I'm a little more skeptical. I'll tell you, Nicole, about Sudan. Mm -hmm. Happy they made that agreement. We'll see. I, I'm a little more skeptical on that one. Yeah. The Biden administration has gone slow to answer that part of the question. They've been slow, but on the one year anniversary, uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken did hold a Zoom uh, virtual conference with um, foreign ministers from these countries, and it went well. And Blinken spoke highly of this. It was the only, as I mentioned in the book, it's it was the only area of agreement in the entire 2020 campaign between Biden and Trump. Biden mm -hmm. praised, and rightly so, uh, the, uh, the, the the Abraham Accords. Yeah. But but the Trump, the Biden team has been dragging their heels. So we need to pray that they, that they embrace these things and work on deepening these relationships. Okay, now switching to Afghanistan and um, the uh, U.S.'s departure from Afghanistan that um, we all saw, uh, you know, watched. I wouldn't call it a departure. I would call it a surrender to yeah. the forces of the Taliban, the terrorists there. It was one of the most horrific and um, humiliating moves I've seen an American president make in in history to surrender a country to terrorists that we've already won. OK, mm -hmm. it is. It, it, and it's it's like Biden just decided to pull the Jenga stick out of the whole game and the whole thing collapsed. And as we saw in testimony that we covered, you covered, uh, mm -hmm. I've been a little bit on the move, but you've been doing a great job, Nicole, covering for all Israel and all Arab news. The, the hearings yesterday where one general after another at the top of the food chain, right, said, we advise the president to keep at least 2,500 U.S. troops in Afghanistan. And you say, and, and people say, well, that number is not that many. Well, that's that also kept the 7,500 NATO troops also in place. And it kept the Arab, uh, the Afghan army feeling confident to keep fighting, to keep working, to not give up. So those 2,500 weren't enough to keep the Taliban at bay, but the combination did. And, and, and yet Biden ignored, ignored the advice of his military leadership and created this disaster and left Americans behind enemy lines. Look, we're not a partisan news site, but if, when, when, when a president of either party does something wrong, we're going we're gonna to call him on it. And this was um, horrific and... Uh, humiliating. Well, how does this affect America's relationship with uh, with her Gulf allies and Israel? Well, and with Israel, too. Uh, look, I, well, one of the what Biden just did goes to the heart of this entire book, Enemies and Allies, because the premise of the book is to misunderstand the nature and threat of evil is to risk being blindsided by it. OK, Biden is being blindsided. He was sure that you could pull all U.S. forces out of Iraq, out of Afghanistan, and it would be fine. And people told him, no, that is that is a misunderstanding fundamentally of of who the Taliban is. They're not going to they're not going to treat this well. Uh, Al Qaeda is not going to just let you all let the United States leave without ISIS. Look, look what happened, the, the, the suicide bombing attack. So all that to say, that what, I, what I describe in the book is Biden in 2011, he boasts to this day that he persuaded President Obama to pull all U.S. forces out of Iraq. Now, even Democrats in the Obama administration said, no, 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 that's a bad idea. Leon Panetta at CIA said, it's a bad idea. Bob Gates at, as Secretary of Defense, well, this is a bad idea. Why is it bad? Because if you pull all U.S. forces out of Iraq, you're going to create a vacuum. And into that vacuum is going to surge evil. And this is where ISIS did surge and created its caliphate and then launched genocide, annihilating, slaughtering Christians and other religious minorities like Yazidis, but also slaughtering a lot of Muslims. You, I would have hoped that President Biden would learn the lesson of the debacle of Iraq and not try to repeat it in Afghanistan. But in fact, he is repeating it, and I think it's going to go very, very badly. And so it's, uh, it's to summarize that, 
Unfortunately, Biden's move in surrendering Afghanistan has emboldened our enemies and has rattled our allies. And they and I, I am talking to officials all throughout the region. They don't want to go on the record, but they are telling me in clear as day language, if we can't trust President Biden to deal with the Taliban, how are we going to deal with, how are we going to trust Biden to, to deal with Tehran as the regime in Tehran, in Iran, gets so close to building nuclear weapons? Actually, People are that's, deeply that's, unnerved by this. Well, and that's one of the questions that we had was uh, how close is uh, Iran to a bomb? And um, anyway, I, I think, go ahead, you can answer that. Well, very close. I mean, what, look, Israeli intelligence is saying, we've been reporting on this at All Israel News, that, that uh, Israeli intelligence assesses that Iran is just a few months away from having enough enriched fuel, uranium fuel, that they could start building bombs. That doesn't mean that they've made the decision to go break out and start actually building weapons, but that they could. And then you'd have to build them and then you'd have to make sure they really work, that they've been tested, right? That would be a huge threshold. And then you'd have to attach those warheads to high-speed ballistic missiles. But Nate, make no mistake, as I've written about um, in my columns on All Israel News, what the Iranian supreme leader wants is not to take down a couple of towers in the United States. He wants a nuclear 9-11. Okay? He wants to take out cities. He wants to obliterate the center of Christendom, as he sees it, which is the United States, which he openly calls the great Satan. And of course, he, the supreme leader of Iran wants to obliterate, annihilate, decimate Israel and our six and a half million Jews, he want, the Supreme Leader wants a second Holocaust. That's why he wants nuclear weapons, because this will, by, by taking out Judaism and Christendom, Israel and America, in his view, in his eschatology, he believes this will bring about the end of days and a global Islamic kingdom. And this is incredibly dangerous. It's genocidal eschatology. Mm. Okay, and this the last question that we're going to have time for um, is uh, I think ties in um, and also into the news that I'm reading today um, is what is the role and the future of Turkey, um, you know, in in the Middle East, and um, what do you have to say about that? But I, I find it interesting because right now Iran is is testing um, its military equipment on the border with Azerbaijan which is a, an ally of Turkey. So I find that it's uh, making a big circle in the region right now. So anyway. Yeah, a lot of, lot of cross currents and complications in the Middle East for sure. Turkey is a country that for the last hundred years, we all would have said, I've certainly written about as the model of Muslim moderation. And yet, in recent years, under the leadership of Recep Erdogan, I know people read it as Erdogan, but it's actually pronounced Erdogan. Mm -hmm. Under Erdogan, he is taking Turkey to the dark side. Turkey is a NATO ally, historically, but Turkey is buying billions of dollars worth of Russian high, highly advanced state-of-the-art weaponry. You can't be a NATO ally and buy weapon systems from the Russians. You can't build economic, political, and military deals with Iran. But Turkey is leading, you know, Erdogan is leading Turkey out of the NATO alliance and towards this alliance with Russia, Iran, and this is incredibly dangerous. Uh, yes, uh, early on in this, uh, throughout the the, this, the uh, book tour, I've been talking about it, including on um CBN News. So we got to pray for the people of Turkey. And I write about this in, in some length. I actually create a, a portrait. I, I really do a mini biogra biography of Erdogan because most people aren't familiar with him or how he rose to power or how he's turning Turkey to the dark side. And I think it's important. And I would also say, um, you know, Turkey is such an important biblical country that it, it should matter to us. I mean, it should matter in any country, but especially a country where, you know, a good percentage of the New Testament was either written in Turkey, 
which was known as Asia Minor, or about Turkey to the churches in Turkey, including in the book of Revelation. So uh, it's, it's incredibly dangerous. But listen, I, I, let me close with this, Nicole, and, and you can make any closing comments. I think what I want to th- one point I want to make is that I, Lynn and I turned over the, the copyright of enemies and allies to the nonprofit that runs all Israel news and all Arab news. It's called Near East Media. And I wanted our readers to know that because as I promote this book, um, Lynn and I aren't, uh, you know, receiving any of the, 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 the coming profits from it. We wanted to help build out this new media platform because the book provides the context. But what all Israel and all Arab news does is provide day-to-day coverage of the fast-moving story, right? I love writing books, but if I only write books, then I can't cover and or build a team and uh, and help guide a team to cover the fast-moving stories. What's happening? Why does it? What does it mean? And why does it? Why should it matter to me? Wherever you, me and you, wherever you live in the world, that's what these two news sites do. And uh, I hope that people will a find it helpful. B sign up for our free email newsletters. C become a promoter of this on your own social media. Encourage people to sign up and, and and post articles from us. You know, be your own wire service to your friends because a lot of them they just don't know that we exist yet and that we are hopefully a trusted resource providing credible coverage of stories that that matter to us and I think matter to our readers very deeply because wow there are there is good news happening in the Middle East related to Israel and our neighbors and there's very dark very dangerous uh, events coming and happening and um, it's hard to keep up especially when the media either doesn't cover it or is so biased that you're like oh my gosh I can't even read that that's why we do what we do and I'm glad to have you on the team Nicole oh thank you so much I'm really honored to be here it's been uh well, you know, I, I say we haven't had one slow news day since we started. I know, we, we kind of need a few, right? It's exhausting. Oh, it would be nice. But I just uh, want to say to all our viewers that joined us to the All Israel, All Arab News family, thank you so much. All of your questions are so important. And I wish we could have gotten to them all. And I feel like maybe we can, you know, we'll see how it goes when Joel gets back to Israel, if we do another one. But there were so many nice questions that I would even love to ask just as a reporter doing a feature story. What's next on your agenda? What are you going to write next? What do you know? And what was your inspiration? Well, you know, so a lot of those- Here's one thought, Nicole. Here's one thought. Would the team collate these? Because I'm thinking that maybe it would be good to start writing maybe even a weekly column in, in, in addition to everything else I do, like on Friday, the mailbag or something, and let's start answering these questions on a regular basis, I, because these are good, and, and, I, and I would have loved to spend more time yeah. on them. And we all want to know what your next novel is, but it's okay, you don't have to okay. tell us now. But, um, but also, um, Rick, I know you also had a question, and I think we would need an entire hour for it because he wants to know if the forced vaccination mandates are the mark of the beast or a prelude to the mark of the beast. And I think we would probably need an hour for that alone. So I was, I mean, I just follow all Israel news. We cover the, the mandates in Israel as well, because the, the vaccine mandates seem to have started here. So um before they went to the u.s but anyway we have yeah, and you're doing a good job that's especially your beat and it's an important story israel i will just say israel's unique in the sense we're not the united states we don't have 50 laboratories and say well texas and florida are going to handle it these ways and new york and california are going to handle it these ways it, it, it's a very complicated thing when you're a small country and we've had 7500 almost deaths of covid which to the rest of the world doesn't sound like a lot but it's more than all of our deaths in war and terror over the last 25 or 30 years. So it's a big problem in Israel and, and our government's still trying to figure out how to handle it. Yeah. One mistake they're making among others, among others, the government of Israel is not asking the nation to pray. And, and, and Second Chronicles 7, it, 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 that's a mistake. And the Lord, I think, wants the nation of Israel to be turning to him for healing and help and um that's something we'll have to keep encouraging yeah you would think that they would have done that um by now 18 months or more into it but yeah you're right and you wrote about that very early on in the pandemic time to write it again yeah 
Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, anyway, we just want to thank you all. Have a great day or evening, yes. wherever you're at. Um, <laughs> Please look us up on, on Telegram, on Facebook, and on Twitter, and um, check our websites. Um, I'm sure I missed the social media platform, but um, please join us and um, and at all of these little tidbits uh, that, that Joel's giving us here are really, they're in our news stories on a daily basis. So if you track with us, you're going to see a lot of this stuff um, yes. on a daily basis, but we appreciate your time. And World Outreach Church in Nashville this weekend, World Outreach Church. Come and see me. Oh, great. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much and Thank have you, a blessed day. Shalom, salam. And uh, <laughs> shalom, shalom. Marhaba.